Hello and welcome to the AI Digest. My name is Joaquin and I'm your host. With me today is Kurt Kagel. Kagel with a long A. I made the mistake of saying Kagel. That's the wrong way to say it, apparently. If you're if if you're if you're looking for for um uh Python competitions or if you're about to have a baby, no Kagel is correct, but yeah, yeah. I'm not. A, I'm not about to have a baby. Uh, but uh, yeah, we we were just talking about population growth and decay and a richness of a lot of different things. Um, but let's 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 dive into your background. Uh, you have such a rich uh, background. You 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 do so many things. Um, as as your name uh, underneath your name, your title says you're the editor of the Kegel Report. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Um, I, when I, I, I've been blogging for 20 years, you know, actually as of this year, it's been 20 years and I've discovered that for me, that blogging basically is me telling other people, maybe, you know, kind of writing off into that, that strange universe of, of, uh, you know, readership or viewership in this case, um, you know, just my thoughts. And after a while, it, 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 it kind of kept surfacing as, as um, um, you know, uh, this is my report of the world. And I actually had at one point a, a, a little graphic. It's, it's still floating around. I probably need to redo it. But it had, um, it was an old, old Winchester style typewriter, you know, with the keyboards and, you know, little, little piece of, of parchment in the, in the, uh, uh, in, in the well. Um, and, uh, you know, got the Kale report up, up and on that parchment. And then uh, if you look at the keys, they're actually arranged with spaces to spell the Kegel report as part of that. And this actually kind of emerged for a, um, Initially, for a uh, uh, a report I was doing for Balassage, which is an XML conference, about you know maybe about eight years ago, um, and it stuck, and people kept coming back to me and said, "Oh, you're going to do more stuff with the cable report." And after a while, I said, "Well, I really oh, ought to do something with the name because people know it by now, and it it, it really now has become." Uh, you know, how I work with, with things. So, you know, my newsletter, at least my primary newsletter on LinkedIn is the Kegel Report. And then I've got a number of secondary newsletters like the Antologist or Generation AI that I'm, I've been building up on Substack. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it, as, um, as I've gotten to the point where I am covering more and more things and, and building viewership and, and the like, that's that's kind of become the best moniker I can think of. So, you know, I see you. As, I, I see you as a scribe. I see you writing all the time on LinkedIn. I didn't know you had a Substack. I'm gonna go check that out after this call, and I'm gonna sign up for your newsletter. I mean, you always have an interesting angle, a richness of referencing other phenomenon that you've taken notice but i i i want to say that you are a published author you have 25 i 25 plus i imagine you're, you're going to continue writing uh books that you've contributed to the field of xml svg agile methodologies and more um what's led you to write so much and you know, more and more so in the technical and operational side of technology. Um, they're bookmarks. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, I've not. You know, I've probably made over the course of the last you know, however many years, and I think my first book was published in ninety. I want to say ninety seven, ninety eight time frame. Um, and I've really not. Well, I won't say that. I've I've been averaging actually about a book a year, um, but um, back in the early aughts, um, 
uh, I had, uh, I was actually writing, I think it was, at the time it was Rocks. They, they got bought up, when you say now, by Wiley uh, some time back. But uh, uh, I had been writing for Rocks, and, and uh, at that time, um, there were so many things going on in the XML space, and, and publishing was still a big viable concern. And I was, you know, able to make a pretty decent living for a while. Um, I have found over the years um, that my, you know, writing a book is not terribly lucrative unless you hit that magic sweet spot. Um, and I've done that a couple of times, but it, it's rare. Uh, but when you write a book, you're you're basically committing to a lot of work, and that lot of work, you know can mean that well you're you're making well below what you would be making if you were a barista at Starbucks at least for several years. Um you know, it, it it does eventually kind of catch up, but you know you you don't make a huge amount of out of off of books. Um anymore especially. Um but I've been writing I've been writing primarily as a way to keep track of things more than anything else, you know, whether it's books, the blogs, the postings, um, you know, it's not because I'm actually going off and saying, hey, this is something that I'm wanting to make a, a huge difference in the world. And it's, it's, it's a way for me to kind of say, well, this is a really cool thing. And I want to tell you about it because it's just the kind of person that I am. Um, and I'll probably go on to it tomorrow and there's something else that catches my eye and it's, it's, it's ADHD on steroids. Um, I, I, I yeah. think, um, I think there's a positive constructive way to frame that. And that is, uh, that you like to empower people with knowledge and help them navigate this complex world? Your guide, you know, I think, uh, <laughs> your, your words are meant to be. The lantern in the in the night where people are like, "Where do I go? What do I do?" So um, I appreciate that, in the in the positive sense. Um, well, I, thank you. Uh, um, I, I I I find you know I'm um, I forget the name of the philosopher now that that uh, you know the the one looking for the one true or the one honest man, um, um, but. You know, in, in in some respects, I think that's important. I'm not, I'm not really sure that, um, you know, in the in the context of things and in 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 the broader picture, um, that's what originally drove me to write. Um, it's there's there's just more of kind of a compunction of saying, well, I can sit on all of these ideas that I have. And all of these worries that I have and things like that, and let them stew and not do anything with them, and probably have a very constructive career as a consequence. Um, or, you know, I can get them out of my brain, which is, I think, what a lot of writers actually do. Um, it's it's kind of a question of of, you know, an idea is basically like a bee that has gotten stuck somewhere between your your inner ear and and your skull and it's really really annoying you want to get it out because it's it's frankly a pain in the butt to, to go around with this buzzing in your ear and so you say okay i'm going to commit two hours three hours whatever to getting this damn thing out of my ear and onto paper so i can move on um, and and not have the buzzing. And of course, that works for all of about, say, a day. And then all of a sudden, I'm finding myself going, damn, the bee is back. Um, you know, that's which which is great if you happen to be driving. Uh, you know, if you're if you're writing a blog, because there's usually not always, but there's usually something to write about uh, that you need to, to get off your chest. Um, I had a coworker. I'm just astonished that people read it. You know, that's that's the that to me is the magic is is not not that I can do it. It's the fact that people are actually looking at it and saying, 
oh, well, that's profound. And I said, no, it's a B. Let's be perfectly <laughs> funny. It's a B. Um, I had a coworker that framed it in, in this way. He said, uh, writing is used to crystallize your thoughts. And uh, from that moment on, anytime that I've had to wrestle with an idea or do some calculation or iterate on, on, on some life goal, I spend the time to take a piece of paper and fold it into four parts. I rough draft it and then I expand on that and then I make diagrams to reinforce that. By the end of an evening or a week, I have like a semi-elaborate plan that's not based on reality, but I think I can reason with and actually manifest in some way. But um, I'm curious to, to, to know where you are because I, I you're usually based out of Washington, but I see this uh, this library of uh, this this magical library behind you. Where where are you based out of? Uh, well, you know, this is my this is my library. This is my my tower. Um, you know, as as I was talking about earlier, if you look look in the distance there, you can actually see my my raven, and there's a little skull in the background <laughs> and the like. And um, this was actually a. I'm wanting to say I generated it out of um, uh, Dolly. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Dolly. Um, but it it essentially, um, you know, all of the other images that I saw were were fairly bland. And I said, you know, I'm usually in my library. And if you if I turned off the camera, you see my room and and um, uh, you know, I I do still have books, you know, physical paper books around me. Um, uh, most of which need to be dusted, but, uh, <clears throat> anyway, <coughs> excuse me. You, you're a seasoned technical consultant who has worked for more than a dozen 500, uh, fortune 500 companies, international agencies, and a number of universities. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about some of the work you've done? Um, I recognize you're an ontologist. Uh, but I'm sure you've done any number of other potential areas of consultation. Uh, yeah. One of the first questions that I ask when I wake up in the morning is, what hat am I wearing today? Um, you know, if I, if I can figure out that hat and I can wear it throughout the entire day, it's been a good day. Um, I, I've been involved with areas, you know, specifically talking about knowledge representation, um, you know, way back in, in college, you know, I, I, I've got a bachelor's degree in physics and all that I have, I, I've been wanting to go back for years, but just never had the opportunity. Um, but I have a bachelor's degree in physics and to be honest, it never really was my big, my big love. I, you know, I, I spent most of my university years down in the computer lab where they had um, these Apple II and and IBM um, uh, systems way, way, way back. Um, and <clears throat> um, you know, I I'd, I'd be the first person in the morning uh, in in the lab when they open, and and they'd have to shoot me out at midnight when they when they closed. Um, and I learned a great deal about programming, uh, largely self-taught, uh, in those four years, you know, best, best university education I could have had. But, um, as to, you know, what I call myself, you know, what, what I, I'm, I, I basically focus on knowledge representation and knowledge systems. And and that sounds really pretentious, you know. It it sounds like okay, I'm a philosopher. I'm, I'm no. which you know I I am, but I'm I'm not. <laughs> you know, I, I I I can tell you the difference between Wittgenstein and Kant, for instance, barely. But I you know I I I, I look at it and say, well, you know, there are different takes on what exactly we mean by by you know knowledge and and our understanding of the universe from that perspective. Um, 
I, I call my I call myself an ontologist because an ontologist is someone, you know, the, the word itself basically means a, a a a master or a student, maybe more appropriate, of things. Antos means things in Greek. Um I, and oh oh sorry, go ahead. No, I, I um you know, knowledge representation and ontology and, and modeling ideas, modeling facts and how things work. Um, that's not pretentious at all. I mean, that's a very important skill that makes sense of all the noise that everybody produces. Everybody produces knowledge, events, experiences, and yeah. somebody has to take the time to architect that, harmonize that, and make sense of the redundancies, the edge cases, and how to extend it. I, it's a it's a pretty cool profession. Uh, it's it's a weird one, you know. It's it's kind of like, um, yeah, you know, when it when it really kind kind of comes down to it, I, I'm 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 a computer linguist. Um, you know, my my profession is essentially in helping organizations figure out what their language is. Um, and every organization, you know, I've ever seen actually has an internal language. It has a, a way of describing the things that are important to it. It has an ontology. And, you know, um, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember the, the, uh, uh, the name of, I'm going to look up here. I apologize for that. Um, it's not Barry Smith, although he was pretty seminal. Um, but uh, ontologists uh, or ontology is a specification of a conceptualization. Um, who said, Yeah, Tom Gruber, that's right, 1992. Um, so Tom Gruber was pretty seminal in the field. You know, that, uh, Tom and, and Barry Smith and then um, uh, uh, people like um, uh, uh, James. Um, oh, come on. What's James' Weber? last name? Weber? Uh no, no, no. J uh, Dean Alamang and James. Um, hold on. Dean Alamang, James, 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 James. What is James' title? So uh, just, um, just, yeah, just sorry, a... sorry. I'm uh, James Handler. Jim Handler who wrote okay. at. Uh, RPI? Okay, yeah, Jim Handler over at uh, RPI. You're right. Um, um, being being an architect of knowledge, um, you go and you model what's inside of the heads of people, all the abstract, amorphous uh, ideas that they have, and you wrestle them into shapes and hierarchies and classifications and relate them and connect them like a plumbing system um yeah what what is a system let's talk about systems and what is your perspective what on this um if you go back far enough and you were talking about the 19 late 1950s early 1960s <clears throat> there was um there was a group of people um, that were all kind of clustered around MIT at the time. Uh, and I think they were called, they called themselves the cybernetics or something to that effect. Mm. Um, and among other things, you know, they, they were the first to articulate this notion of, of what became for a while known as systems theory. Um, and a system in that regard is basically um, a it's 
it's an environment in which um, you have structure and order that basically arrives spontaneously uh, as a way of overcoming um, entropy. Entr uh, so, you know, if at, at the very, very basic level, you know, you talk about life and life as a system. Sometimes it's a very simple system. Sometimes it's a vastly complex system. Uh, you, you talk about society and civilizations, and those are systems in that they have, um, you know, they, they basically originate spontaneously, build on one another. Uh, and in the process of building, uh, they create scaffolding and structures that in turn can help others build or find niches or, um, you know, otherwise coexist within the system itself. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you look at it from that standpoint, it's a way of balancing order and chaos. Um, and you know most systems are dynamic. You you know you you could talk about closed systems where, in essence, you know everything the energy that you have within the system is constant. Um, you know there's always got to be energy somewhere. There's got to be something that drives. If you have no energy, you have no system. Um, but once you have that system, then that structure that you have you know, is order out of chaos, which is, I think, actually a good way of thinking about it. You know, you have to have both. If you have order with no chaos, it's it's dead. It's not evolving. Chaos and, is movement. Chaos is the direction of energy, no? Uh, chaos is a lot of things. Chaos is, um, chaos is fractal. Chaos is essentially the the raw noise of the universe uh it is it is essentially in many in many ways you can think of chaos as being the manifestation of energy itself um in in that particular system and, and even when you're talking about a computer and a computer system or a, a large-scale system mm -hmm. that mechanism for chaos um is necessary as a driver you know talking about contemporary systems where you know contemporary data systems you know the reasons that they they exist as systems is because there's always input you know there's there's an infrastructure which is physically built but there's also emerging phenomena that come out of it because the chaos itself normally tends to organize um within the substrates to be able to build complexity and so you know a system is essentially a um is essentially a mechanism by which complexity is maintained a, st uh, a structured structured system right uh in in general yeah but it i mean it's it's it 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 can be you know any number of things. You you talk about a cell, you know, a cell by itself is a system. It it has multiple different participants or, or components. Each of those components interact with one another. Um, you have a source of energy that basically is driving it, you know, mitochondria or something to that effect. But um, it's basically the movement of energy or of information within that system that keeps it uh dynamic and and you know keeps it just tottering over the or just just keeps it on the very teetering edge of chaos um so that you know what you're working with um can adapt to chaotic changes outside so um you know when you talk about a an economy when you talk about a society, when you talk about a computer system, when you talk about AI, artificial intelligence, those are all systems in that regard. And, you know, it's it's easy, and I think sometimes this gets lost in the community, but it's easy to think, well, 
you know, the role of an ontologist is to basically set up a system for classification. And that's one, that's one area where that's probably true. But I also think the role of an, of an ontologist is to recognize that knowledge isn't static. It changes. It, it grows. It sometimes shrinks. You know, it, it is something that we have. Um, you, you can see it uh, really in the evolution of an organization as it adapts to change. Um, and so, um, you know, if you go in with the assumption that, okay, a, a, there is a static ontology, you know, a, a description of things, um, then, um, that will hold for a little while, you know, that provides a certain scaffolding upon which other things build, but it's, it's a lot like, um, you know, you see biologists that will deliberately wreck things like, you know, old ships in yeah. certain areas so that they can grow coral reefs. And the coral reefs are a system they take advantage of the scaffolding of the, of the underlying aircraft or ship that's now been, been sunk um, to build on. And after a while, they actually will get to the point where they ultimately break down that original structure and what you have left is basically the shell of what was there originally that looks vaguely like an airplane or vaguely like a ship but there's not necessarily a ship underneath it now um and and that's the nature of systems it's it's something where uh you know you can see the shell but you can't necessarily see the thing that's underneath the substrate mm. Um, because the substrate is going to change. And at the same time, it also means that systems that are static ultimately are also fragile mm -hmm. um, because there's nothing underneath. Um, there's, you know, once you, once you take out that energy, it's like, it's like, you know, stopping a, stopping a person's uh, heart. Uh, you take out that 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 energy, and very quickly the systems all start to fail. Um, and what you end up with is a corpse, um, because because that corpse represents what the system utilized as the structure to be able to build on, but without the energy in the system to maintain it. Um, eventually all you have left is a shell. And, you know, that's the nature of systems. It's the nature of language, which is also a system. You know, the, the, the language that we speak today, the English that we speak today, um, it has a very, very long and complex history. And it's evolving. It's still evolving. Um, but, you know, it's it, the, the, Eng the English that I speak today would be completely and totally, you know, under, mis, un, un understandable to Chaucer. Um, so you know, if you, if you, and, and, and that's because it evolves, you know, it's anyway. So, you know, that's, that's a system. Okay. So you're, hand -waving here. You, you, you're talking about systems as a, as a means to make sense of chaos and, uh, well, I mean, it's it's not so much making sense of a system basically just is, you know, it's it's something that it leads is, inside of chaos because chaos is everything, everything that is happening everywhere all at once is chaos. If you if you if you yeah. said that chaos is energy, um, it has no direction, it has no intent, it That's just right. happens. But so just, so so okay. so you can think you can think of chaos. And energy, you know, largely being the same thing. What a system does is, is it embodies it embodies complexity um, while trying to minimize the amount of energy um, necessary to maintain it. Um, you know, again, a good example of that would be something like a hurricane. You know, a hurricane doesn't spontaneously exist. Um, you know, you're not going to, to suddenly, you know, go in and say, hey, you know, 
We're going from clear skies to look, there's a hurricane overhead. It's not a thing in that regard. It's it's basically huge amounts of water or huge amounts of heat that are then using the substrate of of you know oceanic water to build clouds that in turn essentially take on a life of their own. That life of their own is the system, is the hurricane. And that system essentially has definite, you know, it's it's it has definite complexity to it, mm -hmm. but it's complexity that once you once you remove the chaos out of that complexity, it collapses. You know, you go on to land and eventually because there is no more heat um, and no more water driving driving that, um, you know, there is not enough energy to maintain the complex vortices and, and and so forth that you have. So, you know, they're they're all interrelated. Um, um, James Glick wrote a fantastic book called Chaos um several years back a couple decades back now and i don't know if he's i, I suspect he's probably actually written uh, a couple different um uh versions of it but he talks about chaos and complexity and systems theory um uh at a very layman level um and i you know it's still recommended i think it's it, for me it's actually one of my touchstone books um so, there's this uh, idea that you spun up on um a vehicle falls into the bottom of the sea coral uses that as an advantage by encompassing that structure and using it to build and branch off and using the materials from that to continue to ex expand leaving yep. a shell leaving the remnants of what was initially there yeah. Um, systems and the conversion of energy of chaos to something that we, you, something that you can measure as productivity or valuable or useful or following some sort of purpose. What, like, doesn't that have anything to do with processes of how you direct the flow of energy in a system? Um, yes, you know, absolutely. Um, the, you know, yeah, there, there's a, a chicken and egg quandary that you have here. Um, you know, is in an organization or in, a, in a, any system, you know, is the, uh, the structure, the order that results as you move energy through the system. Something emerges um you know is as is, is, um you know terry pratchett in a number of his books you know talks about this notion of in in his novels you know talks about the notion of is there a um in this case from night watch which is actually one of my favorite novels of his um the protagonist goes back in time uh, he is the he is basically in the in his time he's a duke, but he goes back in time and finds himself in the very uncomfortable position of now being kind of the grizzled old veteran, and he is now talking to his younger self, who does not realize at the time that he is talking to himself thirty years down. Um, there's in as part of this, there is a um, a monk. Uh, kind of modeled on James Bond. I've always thought that was an interesting concept. But that monk, in trying to get, you know, senior commander Duke uh, Samuel Vimes back to his own time, he's, he, he makes the comment, well, the problem right now is that there is no Vimes-shaped hole in the future for you to be moved back to. You know, we have changed the nature of time in such a way that we have eliminated this particular role. And this kind of goes back and beggars the question, do things happen because 
there is an individual that is pushing for those changes? Or does the system basically evolve a hole that needs to be <laughs> filled by someone who will, yeah. in fact, make those changes? Yeah. And so, you know, in many ways, I think process, for the most part, um, is that person filling that hole, which, you know, is, is awful because it sounds like, well, there's no determinism. And of course, there's or there's 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 no free will. Well, yeah, there it's, is. It's, it's the hero's journey, right? You're cast it's upon the hero's journey. Yeah. a problem. You have to go on the adventure, find the wise, a sagacious counsel. They give you some sort of supernatural power. Yeah, interesting. But but I think that when you get when you get back to that, and you say, okay, you know, in this organization, um, process is often a shell. You know, we talked about the artifacts that remain. Well, you know, you develop a uh, you develop a way of doing things. You know, you solve a problem. Here is the way that you solve the problem. And then process basically emerges as here is the artifact that's left so that when I am no longer filling that particular hole, this thing can continue to be done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a, a, a great story um, about um, the, the Empress uh, Catherine the Great uh, Tsar of Russia, Serena of Russia, 18th century, early 19th century. Um, but one time, um, as she was walking through her palace, uh, she looked out a window. It was winter. It's Russia. It's always winter. Um, and um, noticed in among the snow, um that and i've told this story backwards but i'll i'll continue it noticed in the snow that there was this this um rose and the rose had somehow against all odds managed to spring up in the snowbank and it was there and had then said i want to assign a card to make sure that no one picks that rose because it makes me feel happy that that is there and I would occasionally like to come back and see it. hundred years later, um, you know, the, the, the current Tsar of Russia noticed this guardsman standing outside, shivering. It's, it's the middle of winter. And the guardsman is inside an inner court, courtyard not a very big one, you know, maybe maybe about 30, 40 feet square. And it's just standing there. And he comes in, summons the guard and says, what are you doing? And the, and the guard says, oh, well, I have to stand guard over the rose. What rose? The rose that 100 years ago, um, you know, Catherine the Great said needed to be guarded. That's a process. That process basically is said, I've created a shell. And that shell is there to do things. And occasionally it gets to the point where, where once things change, that process gets left behind. The need for the process gets left behind. Okay, okay. A static, and so a, static a, lot, process. a static process. Yeah, it, well, it, yeah, it's it, it's 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 yeah, it's a static process, but it's it's a process nonetheless. It's it's something where you have established a set of protocols to be able to accomplish a certain goal, and then you never told those protocols to stop when this those that that goal is no longer relevant to what you need to do. Um, and that's really what a lot of process management is all about is the fact that, yes, you have to have a way of organizing, but oftentimes the organization comes first. It's, it's the, the, we have to figure out a way to do something. Here's a way, and, and you know, once I leave this mortal coil or I get hit by a bus, here's a way to make sure that it stays going. 
Well, if you don't include that final terminating step of if this is no longer relevant, stop doing this process, that process will remain as a shell mm. for the next forever, potentially, until the whole thing collapses, at which point it doesn't matter anymore. The, sh the shadow of an intent. The shadow yeah. of a, It's of the a shadow of an intent. I, I like that. That's, that's a good way of thinking about it. So... Okay, we've talked about the chicken and the egg of the process in a system. And sometimes you have a process and that builds a system and the, the system evolves and you have subsequent processes. I mean, depends how, how you scope. You, you can oh, yeah. define it ways, right? Um, that kind of leads us to fractals. Um, yeah. So that brings us back to, to fractals. So, um, I'm a student of the 80s. You know, that's when I went to, to school. And, and the thing, and fractals were big in the 80s. Um, fractals, fractals were originally, um, you know, first formulated under that name. Although there were many people before then who, who worked with it. By... Um, um, let me say it's George Mandelbrot. Um, and you know we know that as the Mandelbrot curve now, which is the 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 big spider-like thing that has been the subject of so many calendars. Um, but in essence, uh, what Mandelbrot did was to specify or to to kind of pull together a lot of different kinds of observations about things that kind of branch between dimensions so you know an, an example of that you know the the classic example of that is determining what the coastline of england looks like and you know if you if you were to take a um yeah, take a yardstick that was a mile long and you use that yardstick to determine what the map is of, of that map of England, then what you would get is a certain length. What's the, what's the length of the coastline? If you have that or half that um, and make it, you know, so that your, your yardstick becomes finer, it also is going to increase that length. So the smaller you make the measure, the, lo the longer that coastline becomes until eventually you get to a stage where the coastline effectively has an infinite length associated with it, which makes no sense. And that, it makes no sense in classical terms, but he said that a great deal of what we're looking at with mathematics or with, with reality, with, with nature, actually has these characteristics. Uh, and he called them fractals because they were essentially fractional dimensions that because of the fact that, that their determination of length or any other metric was essentially something that uh, was dependent largely upon the length of the measuring stick, um, then you could basically say that, um, uh, you know, this is one of the characteristics that you have of these dimensions that are seem to occupy more than, than the dimensionality of, of, say, a straight line, but nonetheless are not quite to the next level, you know, not quite making the jump to the next level. And so that fractal dimension became a measure of essentially the complexity of that curve. It also became a measure of the degree of self-similarity so that there were certain points in that coastline where you discover that there are structures which tend to repeat themselves fairly broadly and then repeat themselves more narrowly and narrower, more narrowly so. And um, this self-scaling characteristic, you know, the ability to scale at different dimensions, was another aspect of this. 
there's a lot of you know when you when you look at these dimensions and you say okay well you know we have the coastline of of england and it has a dimension roughly of about 2.15 or thereabouts um you know it, it's actually something that you can assign a number to that you can say it's a fractal dimension and that fractal dimension in turn um means that it has certain characteristics so uh it turns out that the chaos noise also has those kinds of dimensions that you know there are because noise is basically something that's measured and because that measurement is something that requires a certain yardstick to be able to determine you know the, the metrics of that noise noise has is chaotic you know it's not purely random because there are always dependencies but it is something that you look at things like brownian movement you know how atoms jiggle in space no, noise, that is oh, go on noise is relative to the environment that it's in and the point where at which you're observing it right yeah uh yes yes so when you when you talk i mean noise in that regard is statistical in nature you know it's it's the there's there's a fine line between entropy statistics chaos and noise um noise is essentially the um the, the random perturbations of the fractal dimension um as it you know as as you move through a given system you see it a lot when you start talking you know when you when you start looking at um heisenberg's uncertainty principle so, um you know, so quick question i mean uh, i'm just gonna move to the <laughs> the aspect of fractals where you're, sh you're you're showing that um if you break the measuring stick in half and you keep dividing it smaller and smaller it keeps it expanding in in length is that the first yeah. aspect that the curve that's that's one aspect of it yeah okay so with that curve expanding into infinity and the fact that we were talking about the chicken and egg of does the process make the system or the system make processes these concepts are sort of overlapping in that sense of uh, it replicates itself and there's variation and there's noise and um we were going to mention something about emerging behavior yeah. and adaptive systems how do we tie so, that in okay so when you think about there's there's an, there's one particular um, um, yeah one particular fractal that was first discovered by I want to say James Lorentz back in the 1970s. James Lorentz was actually a meteorologist. He's a weatherman, and he had been fascinated by by the complexity of weather. Uh, it been fascinated by the fact that uh, when you are, you know, when you look at how weather systems evolve, um, that they that they tended to evolve in the same way, even though they weren't identical. Uh, you know, that it, environment always had an, an, an aspect on on you know Michael. what kind of storm you had, or whether it died out early, or whether it became a a, a class five hurricane or whatever. Um, and so he started exploring, and, and he actually started saying, "There's there is a curve that is called the logistics curve." Um, and the logistics curve is actually one that most people are familiar with, even if they don't necessarily know what, what it means. And that is that um, if you measure a population, you know, anything that has a, a bell graph distribution or a, a Gaussian distribution, as it's known, um, and you basically plot a curve of the area underneath that, what you get is something that smart, starts out very, very close to zero, 
and then it seems to slowly uptick until it seems to hit a a um a tipping Critical point mat. okay okay yeah. yeah um and that tipping point then sees explosive growth uh it you know it increases 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 and then it begins to go the other way and it goes the other way once you finally get to the point where you're getting to the upper end. You've you basically hit the halfway point. And now that area, the area underneath is still growing, but it's growing slower and slower as you get to the other side of the curve. So that normal distribution basically creates a logistics curve. Um, and that logistics curve describes any number of things. You know, the classic example would be you put a couple of a, a breeding pair of rabbits onto an onto an island with lots of grass on it. You know, there's an island in Hawaii that's called Rabbit Island for precisely that reason. Um, it's bare now. The reason that it's bare is because the the rabbits essentially did what rabbits do, which is reproduce based upon the available food, but they also did so in a way that caused their population to go from one rabbit to a whole bunch of rabbits, all basically pulling from the same thing. And once you get from that to, um, you know, eventually it got to the point where they were all competing against one another. There were no predators to oh. to cut down in the population of rabbits and it it then slowed down and followed this very same logistics curve throughout so that logistics curve is very very common you know it, it occurs all over the place there's a similar one called a power rule which basically you know you you see it when you start talking about populations where you have one person that has almost everything and a great number of people that have almost nothing. And then there's this, what looks like a hyperbolic curve in there. And that power law basically emerges unlike the other word, because there's essentially a system dependency between the, the, um, between the terms that are used, the tokens that are used, which gets back ironically enough to, uh, uh, when you start talking about machine learning in, in, in that area. But, you know, not to get too far off tangent, that that island is bare because you had a logistics, logistics curve where the population peaked and then declined so rapidly that it could never recover. Resources went away, and the island now is a, is a rock sticking out of the ocean. Um that what Lorenz discovered, if you take that that logistics curve and you say, okay, this is normally a variable, it's, it's normally based upon time, but what if it wasn't? What if you replaced that T with a complex number, a Z number, um, you know, which has both a, a, a real and an imaginary component? And what he discovered was that once you do that, um, the logistics curve essentially instead becomes a cloud because each term uh, or each, each iteration, which is really what a fractal does, but each iteration of the, taking that equation and using it to plug back into the variable um, caused it to create these random cl point clouds, but they weren't quite as random as he thought they were. It turned out that if you if you plot them over a long enough period, um, you can actually get a measure that looks like what's called now a Lorentz curve, where essentially you get branching, and the branching, it gets larger and larger and larger and more and more complex until eventually it looks like there's nothing but this wall. But the fascinating thing about that is that it eventually reaches a point where you have all this, and then suddenly there's nothing. It collapses except for one thread. And that thread then basically follows the same behavior over and over and over again, but in increasingly tight intervals. It's so almost a, it, It's almost as if you're watching the universe breathe in that instance. 
where there's everything and there's nothing. Everything exactly. and nothing. So when you take that idea and then you plug that in, it turns out that it is a surprisingly sophisticated way of thinking about IFS as a reiterated fractal systems that says that out of complexity, eventually something emerges as scaffold. Um, and, you know, that occurs over and over again. And you see that, um, you, you see that process. And it's basically the same thing that Mandelbrot was talking about. He was saying, if you take a shape and you self-replicate it at, low, at smaller and smaller scales, um, what uh, emerges there is essentially something that looks a lot like randomness, but isn't. It's chaos. It's almost the same thing. Now, what that point is that that you know that that point where you basically cause everything to coalesce. That is in an organization. Um, essentially the stage and i'm trying to think where i was going with this but it's it's that within an organization or within a system <laughs> that represents a phase shift you know the rules have changed um in our society the pandemic was actually the reason for a phase shift and everything after the pandemic looks very weird because there was a disruption as we as we basically had to borrow ahead of us by about 10 years a lot of technology that had been germinating was going to get there eventually you know probably about 20 28 2030 and moved it all forward and all of a sudden everything seems to be moving so very rapidly and it's not really the case i mean it's it's just that we're borrowing from future technology we're we're essentially dealing with this phase shift where we've gone from ice to water or water to steam um you know there are different manifestations of the same substance but they're different manifestations of those substances because the rules have changed and that change that phase shift is essentially a form of chaotic collapse um how do we wield this for constructive means? I mean, it, it, you know, it's fascinating that things come in cycles, things hold patterns. Well, well, they don't, but that's you know, they they come in patterns, but they don't necessarily come in cycles. Um, you know, cycles imply regularity, and, and and regularity is actually something. You know, as as Twain said, you know, uh, history uh, history does not repeat, but it certainly rhymes. Mm -hmm. Um. You know that's that's really kind of what we see, and and as to how we we do that, you know, it's it's kind of just becoming aware that these that these exist, and then using them to recognize that not all phenomena is linear in nature, uh, and in fact, you know, linearity is the rule, but it is not always the case. Um, you know, human brain, and this is this gets back into knowledge and knowledge engineering. The human brain, uh, my, you know, the, the the Kegel model of the human mind, if you will, um, you know, for what it's worth, is basically that um, we <laughs> most sentient beings and I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna keep the term sentient very loose but most sentient beings when you get right down to it are constrained by the amount of energy that they have available their budget of energy is limited and so um you know each kind of life evolves a certain strategy for maintaining that budget for for ensuring that the information that they have or excuse me the, the energy that they have is used to continue to propagate the species you know, it's richard dawkins and some of his stuff which you, take it as you will dawkins has a checkered past um but if you look at 
that from that particular modality and then say, hey, um, uh, how do I best minimize the amount of brain power that I'm utilizing here? So, or the amount of energy that my brain consumes, it consumes a lot, you know, there's, there's a, you know, great deal of, of processing goes by. That's the reason when you look at a, a, a heat map of the body, the, the, the head just lights up. Um, it's, it's a very expensive thing for us to maintain. Now, why do we maintain it? It's because it turns out that, yes, you know, intelligence happens to be a survival trait most of the time in very chaotic situations. Um, it's not necessarily a, a, a great trait when nothing really changes very much. And the vast majority of time, nothing changed very much. You know, the environment didn't change until it changed catastrophically. At which point, you know, the you you have to spend a lot of time rethinking what's going on when you're rethinking what you're doing is you're building a model that says what does the universe look like to me what does my world look like to me right now and that model basically is what holds you instead what um, um what keeps in essence the, the the model is essentially the guide for getting through day to day where nothing significantly changes. And it's the way that most people operate. It's the way I operate. Um, at some point, however, when the, ch when a change does occur, if that change is sufficient to threaten the, you know, threaten the continued propagation of the system that's called me, you have to basically alter that model, which is a very expensive proposition. It's, it's what causes a lot of cognitive dissonance. Um, it's the brain essentially rewiring itself to be able to deal with the new reality as it faces. Well, we hit cognitive dissonance in spades back in, in with, with the pandemic. And we threw out a whole lot of assumptions that we thought were true and aren't. Um, that's causing a great deal of chaos in the system. That's causing a great deal of, you know, we're, we're at a point where we're seeing this, you know, we're, we're making a phase transition in our society. And it's a very painful phase transition. You know, we're going to something that we don't really know the shape of yet because we don't have enough experience to be able to say this is where we're going. But that is really what where all this ties together, you know, Lorenz basically came back and said, well, that, you know, it, it's very much dependent upon initial conditions. It's very much dependent upon interactions. Um, you know, there's the whole argument, you know, the, 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 the individual points of the Lorenz curve when mapped out in, in a, in a phase diagram, um, by themselves or seem to be disconnected. But if you make enough of them, they form what looks like a butterfly. And that's and that's butterfly has actually then become something of a metaphor because, you know, it's the idea of a butterfly flapping in, in the forest could cause a hurricane. Now it doesn't. But, well, you know, it's... It, it's <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry? It, it, it might. We don't know. It might, but you know, it, it's it's basically just one variable in a whole bunch of variables, and maybe that one variable is a thing that basically pushed the system over the edge and caused it to form into the system that you needed. In most cases, it doesn't. In most cases, it's just a butterfly. But every so often, that damn chaotic butterfly just causes hurricanes all over the place. And, you know, there was actually a very interesting paper that came out recently talking about time travel. It's all interrelated. Um, but that time travel, the, the, the author of the paper basically said, you know, it is theoretically possible that 
time travel could actually exist, that you could go back in time. But the universe, as Terry Pratchett would love to say, really doesn't like to be changed all that much. And so what it does is it adjusts the world in little ways so that what would happen will still happen. It's just that the actors and the scenery may be a little different from one set to the next. Um, and, and this notion uh, of, you know, the, the universe essentially saying, okay, well, yes, you can have local change and have to have local change. But, you know, long term, it is, it's something that uh, you're still going to basically be looking at the aggregate of actions happening over immense spans of time, um, you know, that do follow entropic rules, uh, that do basically ultimately get to the point where, yes, everything does wind down, you know, we will, you know, within about one and a half billion years, you know, life on Earth will cease to exist. Um, because, you know, because the energy inputs are actually, in this case, they're, they're pushing us up past a point where life as we know it is sustainable. Um, and, you know, those are phase transitions. Those are the things where we're going from one phase to another until we reach a point where there is no clear path forward. Um... I have, I have one last question for you, uh, and that is, how do we take this rich theory of a chaotic butterfly folding within itself and the uh, birth and an evolution of a process turns into a system that spins up other processes that spin up other systems and they evolve and th there's so much interconnectedness here. How do we grab a hold of the tail of that thing and write it? How do we how do we use that for a constructive means? How how do you harness it? You know, is what what I hear you saying. Um, you know, where's the value proposition in chaos? Well, that's I mean, it's a good question. It's one that a great number of people, myself included, would like to know. Um, you know, the thing about chaos is that it deals with what I'd call meta patterns. And the meta patterns are basically the thing that forms self-similarity. And if you understand and can identify what those meta patterns are, you can, to a certain extent, utilize them to help you understand when things are changing dramatically, what the likely outcome of those changes are, you know, what, where you're moving to. Um, and by doing that, you know, you can, you can basically anticipate that certain trends, you know, which is essentially kind of a measure of that chaos will play out over a certain period of time. And then you can speculate on, on what those trends are. So, you know, I, uh, a lot of what I do is trends analysis. A lot of what I do is actually looking at, um, you know, what are the, where are the energy flows? You know, where's the information flows? Because the two are, are very, very closely related. Uh, uh, Shannon Clark um, first kind of came to that realization back in, in the uh, 1940s. Um, and uh, Shannon, I'm, I don't remember what, whether it's the first or last name. Anyway, uh, Google it. Uh, but at, at any rate, you know, the, he was actually one of the first to, to say information is, um, is stochastic in nature. Um, that it is, you know, he, he didn't have the framework yet to describe it. But uh, if, you, if, if he had come back and talked with Mandelbrot you know, 40 years later, uh, you know, he would have said, oh, it's it's fractal in nature. Um, you understand the fractalness. You can basically utilize it to compress to a certain degree um, how you describe a system. 
And in fact, a lot of current AI thinking, you know, getting all the way back to the arc, um, is ultimately when you look at an LLM, an LLM, a large language model ultimately is just a form of compression. It's a way of saying, I have taken a lot of documents and I've compressed them in such a way as to turn that information to a holograph or into a hologram. I'm sorry. Uh, what is a hologram? A hologram is uh, in light, you know, we think of a hologram as, hey, look, it's a 3D image. Well, it's not quite, although, you know, because of the nature of optics, it, it sort of is. But it's essentially a fractal representation of it's an image. It's a projection. Um, and, you know, you can't point to an LLM and say, where is this information? You can reverse engineer it, but you can't actually point to a place that this is where this index is. That's what a prompt is supposed to do. But it's, you know, the, the way that a prompt works is, is that it is effectively creating a vector that's use, utilizing a chaotic system or chaotic means of, of identifying resources within this map, this space. So in, in essence, you know, that's, it's this kind of theory you know, is personified. Because it's a compression, you can basically put a lot of information into a very small space. But also because it's a compression, that's lossy. You know, you lose information in the process because you, you can't necessarily retain uh, all of the interconnectedness. The graph that exists from this becomes kind of scattered and... and and you end up with latencies where the connections are there, but because the space becomes so large, the time necessary to pull those latencies or to, to overcome that latency becomes prohibitive. So it becomes an imperfect resolution of the original object and not a perfect one. Um, and and a, this an is echo all, it, it becomes an, an echo. It, yeah, multiple echoes, but yes, yes. Um, but it also basically means that, I mean, this is a, a perfect example where chaos has a direct impact, where it's been monetized, you know, quite successfully um, for doing things like artificial intelligence. Um, now, you, you do have to basically go back and say, because information itself is fractal, because you know you're you're talking, talking about dealing with conceptual spaces and then adding into that this mechanism, it's actually pretty close to the way that I think that the brain actually does work, among other things. Um, you know, there's a part of the brain that is really wired to think like a neural network, and you know why we call it a neural network. It's made of neurons. It's it's all interconnected. It's all graphs. But because there, because there's a fairly limited um, amount of space to put all of these neurons, those neurons aren't physically necessarily close to one another. And it's that latency that you have uh, within the brain itself that means that when you pull up a thought, you know, what you remember is usually not an absolutely pure recollection of everything that you have but it's kind of a deep fuzzy i kind of sort of remember what we did but if you ask yeah. me about it it's an approximation um and that's because it, it, it's a fractal Dude. um so we're dealing with we're dealing with holograms here which actually makes for a a, a great yeah. thing for doing creativity but it's actually a pretty piss poor way of creating a uh uh, a search engine because it's you're, it's a lossy search engine. Kurt, you've blown my mind like six, <laughs> eight times throughout the whole explanation of this whole fractal system. Uh, but you've given me a lot of food for thought on how to chew through this uh, esoteric, uh, nebulous idea that holds no shape and keeps shifting the shape as you keep looking and peering into it. I mean, um, also, thank you for for representing LLMs in that fashion and and and, and bridging that to the 
to the way that thoughts and memory kind of gets fuzzy and morphed and every time you look at it it shifts it's yeah. it's very very similar to how llms work that's an interesting way yeah. to look at it we're not yeah, fact based people we're we're we're, we're, we're approximation based or organisms oh uh, we have to be you know a fact and an absolute perfect memory system is almost unmaintainable once you get to a certain level we would die, no. wouldn't we? I mean, you, you we'd, we'd, we'd have to carry around. You, you'd have to have a brain the size of a, of a rail, railroad car. No, um, but we would we would be killed by uh, other predators that have a, an evolutionary way of adapting to the to the mechanisms that we have in our head because we would just be doing very routine things if we lived in a perfect world based yeah. on fact. But but it's a dynamic system and our brains are adapted to navigate that dynamic system with dynamic processing. Um, wicked dude. Wicked. Uh, I, I, I thoroughly it's enjoyed fun. You know, there's, there's, there's some, some really interesting things there. So I didn't, didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, parsing through this idea. I mean, the more that I, I I'm reflecting on it, the, the, the more exciting it is. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Kurt for coming on the show and thank uh, you. we're going to have to do a, a part two to this and it's going to have to be at, at least three hours at least uh, <laughs> for us to really get I, 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 I hope your thing. audience is, 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 has the ability to turn the thing off and, and go use the bathroom or whatever because that's a long time to sit through an interview but uh, sure I look forward to it no this was really rich and, and totally worth the, we, we, we took a road trip and in in the fractal land, uh, it's very exciting. Um, yeah. Well, thank you, Kurt. Again, really. Thank you.